Judge Dredd is just a badass character, a badass comic. One of my favorite things that England has produced, it's given us some of the best writers and artists in comic books. It's just given us so much. As a teenager, I just thought it was cool because it was an action-packed badass. But then as an adult, you start to realize that it's just dripping with satire. It's been around, let's see, next year it'll be 40 years. Because it started in 1977, March of 1977. And it's been running weekly ever since then. Uh, yeah, it's a little different than how American comics tend to come out 22 pages a month. Instead, they chop it up and it comes out weekly in six-page installments. Uh, in an anthology series called 2000 AD. At least that's the one that we're going to take a look at today. Because we're going to look at the tropes of Judge Dredd. Created back in 77 by John Wagner with artist Carlos Ezquiera and overseen by editor Pat Mills, they just created this amazing, amazing look at America dialed up to 11. Because this is a post-apocalyptic world in which Judge Dredd and all the other judges are basically police that are allowed to act as judge, jury, and executioner. Now, I think what we should start with are listing some of these tropes that we'd see in every issue. With over 40 years of history, there's a lot of different tropes, but here's some of the big ones you could expect to find in most stories. Mega City 1's fascist overtones contrasted with an even worse fate. Artificial intelligence gone haywire. A new chief justice making the justice system even worse. Dread gets a new piece of tech. Dread loses a partner. Character or location names that are puns. Clones. New details on past corruption forming the world Dredd lives in. Mutants. New apocalyptic devastation. Fictional political parties. Commentary on Dredd actually aging. Future slang. Dredd mentoring a new judge. Alright, like I say, this is an English comic book. Let's go to a London comic book store, find a Judge Dredd story, and get to it. In 1978, Forbidden Planet, the store behind me, became the third store in all of London to specialize in comic books. It quickly became the most popular. It actually started right around the corner on the same block on Denmark Street. But I'm going to go in this one here right now. We're going to find something cool. Trust me. Alright, so this story, Block Mania, started in 2000 AD, issue number 236. That was back in late 1981, but it's a classic story that leads to an even bigger story, Apocalypse War. I think I've got that covered here. Yeah, Apocalypse War. That was a huge story. Let's read four issues of Block Mania. That'll be 24 pages, roughly equivalent to a single monthly periodical of an American comic book, and every time I come across one of these tropes, I have to take a drink from some sort of British lager. We're gonna go to a pub. We're gonna drink authentic 
English alcohol. Let's do it. The issue begins commenting on how block wars are commonplace, but this is something on the next level. We should explain just a little bit about Judge Dredd's world. Mega City 1 is basically this safe zone outside of an apocalyptic wasteland. It extends all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, down to the tip of Florida, or at least maybe mid-Florida. Huge area, but it's all one city, and everybody lives in blocks. These massive skyscrapers that house, like, you know, I think it, they've said, like, 50,000 people. And the blocks would sometimes have turf wars with other blocks. Uh, but this that's going on, something else. But right here on the first page, we do have our first trope, name puns. That's right, we've got two blocks that are named, and both of them are puns. You're going to see a lot more of them. I'm only going to start naming the puns for this first page, but basically every block is a pun. One block is named Max Jaffa. He was a popular British violinist at the time. And the other is named Fred G. Block. Fred G. was a fictional character on the popular British drama Coronation Street, which is actually, I believe, still running. Sort of a, a soap opera type of show. And Fred G. was uh, just this pompous jerk, like car driver guy. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, although it is a little odd that both of them are such British references when supposedly Mega City One is... America. The issue starts by showing us not Judge Dredd, but rather people that live in these city blocks. And there's something that's just got them really, really tense. It seems like a little bit more than what's normal. The people in Mega City One were generally tense because A, it's very claustrophobic, everybody's jam-packed together, and second, Robots have taken most of the jobs out there, so people have a lot of free time, not much to do. So they, they tend to be very, like, high-strung. But there's something a little bit more in this. And uh, a war breaks out against the Dan Tana block. Now, Dan Tana, I mean, talk about forgotten trivia, but it's another pun name. Dan Tana was a private eye detective on the American show Vegas. It was like, I think it only lasted like two years, but I, I know it was on around like 81, 82. It was an Aaron Spelling show. Things seem to be getting bad as Judge Dredd and a few other judges pull up. They quell one of the blocks and some of the judges are like, phew, that was close, but Dredd's like, no. We've got a six block war on our hands. So this isn't just two blocks, this is, this is something bigger. But it ends on a second trope. Uh, future slang. You've got Dredd, or maybe it's actually uh, one of Dredd's other judges. I can't quite tell here, but they're saying Drock, which is, I guess, some sort of future curse word. Future slang. The next few pages feature Dredd and his fellow judges basically engaged in riot control, uh, but they're having a hell of a time because there's just so many people. So Dredd orders the use of something new called Strom Gas. I'm not 100% sure what it is. Some of the other judges argue that they shouldn't use it in an open area. But Dredd's like, no, people are dying. We have to escalate things. Uh, Dredd is the law, so everybody listens to him. And uh, basically that's new tech. A lot of times he'd get something new on his bike or something new on his lawgiver pistol. It could fire different types of ammunition. But in this case, it's just uh, that they've got a tank that can fire some sort of riot control gas. New tech. Through Judge Dredd's heroic efforts, the riot is quelled at the last moment. And he goes back and talks to Chief Judge Griffin, basically the head of the judges. And Griffin reveals that it's not even just these six blocks. It's like the whole northern quadrant. So these riots are essentially an example of something worse than the fascism, the outright fascism, that the judges enforce throughout Mega City One. Uh, it's beyond what the law can handle. It's just people going mad. And Dredd suspects there's something behind it, doesn't know what. That's the mystery. But, this is an example of another trope. Something worse than fascism. 
there's a quick interlude where even judges are starting to take sides on which block they want to win for various reasons. So it's not just citizens that are being affected, it's the judges too. Anyway, Dredd starts rerouting judges from any sort of other duty in other areas, bringing them all together to try to control this just massive, massive riot. As they're fighting this, Dredd comes across this pretty small uh, recurring character uh, who's one of his informants, and he lets him know that something big is going down at the Ricardo Montalban apartments. It turns out someone there has figured out a way to combine two common items, some sort of like plastic that they use, and they can create a deadly gas, and they plan to use it against some of the other blocks. So, you know, thousands and thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, are all threatened by this madness, this anger that's taking over. Judge Dredd and a bunch of other judges get to the Ricardo Montalban, I love saying that, the Ricardo Montalban block, just as they're driving away some huge tanker trucks filled with their new deadly explosive, and uh, one of the judges gets shot by a sniper. Judges died pretty regularly. A lot of times they were Dredd's protégés, partners, etc. In fact, in the coming issues, once it gets, actually just before Apocalypse War, still in this Block Mania story arc, uh, a big recurring character gets killed. Fifth trope, Dredd loses a partner. Dredd has a plan to stop this block's factory from creating any more of this poisonous gas. He uses these sonic emitters to basically just destroy the whole factory. It kills everybody inside. So we're talking tens of thousands of people dying. And as it comes down, you know, Dredd is really starting to suspect that there's something behind all of this. But that's the end of, of this four-issue, 24-page story. Um, I don't want to spoil too much if you haven't read it yet, but there's another power at work that has a vendetta against Mega City One. Uh, it's very 80s, but you know, at the same time, the cool thing about Judge Dredd's stories is they work as satire of what was going on at the time politically, and yet things don't seem to always have changed that much. You know, we still have so much xenophobia to deal with. We still have such a fear of other nations, other countries, uh, which becomes part of this story. Uh, and just this scary world where the police seem to have unchecked, unlimited power. Uh, it's pretty weird how Judge Dredd is our protagonist, because sometimes he's not likable at all. Sometimes he starts to learn to be just a little bit more progressive, and other times he's just a total fascist that, you know, in, in these stories that we just read, he kills a lot of people that are essentially innocent. They're just being manipulated into being angrier. And, uh, yeah, it's a little scary. It's a little scary how much it can still mirror our own world. But that's what makes these stories still worth reading. Um, the cool thing about Judge Dredd is even though there's tons and tons of stories, you can pick up these, those huge case files compendiums that put every issue in order. It's a lot like the Marvel Essentials that I covered in my uh, Fantastic Four review. Alright, let's head out and one, two, three, four, five tropes, five drinks. Let's do it. So it has been a long, busy day, but I've got a bunch of beers, and I'm just now realizing I've got no way to open them. <laughs> oh boy. Ow! <laughs> Stop it! Uh, I realized I'm in a hotel, so I borrowed a bottle opener from the front desk. We're good! Let's drink! So... Just hanging out in my hotel room. Uh, first beer I got is something called London Pride. It says it's uh, brewed beside the Thames since 1845. Okay, that's a decent beer. It's um, it's not especially strong. Um, malty. Malty, but but in a good way, um, like you know, not a cider, but um, 
I taste the malt more than I, I typically do in a beer. It's pretty good. It's the end of a long day, folks. I'm tired and uh, just drinking in my hotel room, and I'm very amused seeing myself in the back there. That's pretty cute. I'm a cute little guy. I'm exploring the world. All right, I'm still awake. It's time for my second drink. Look at this one. That's kind of fun. Hobgoblin? Uh, let's see, it says it's traditionally crafted legendary ruby beer. I don't know what ruby beer is. I've never had one before. Oh, hmm. That's an interesting, um, it's an interesting blend. Uh, I, boy, you know, I'm just not much of a, a beer connoisseur like some of my friends to, um, pick out what tastes like what, but it, it tastes good. I'll, I'll give it that. Hmm. And then take a look at like how it's got, you know, a hobgoblin here. There was another I saw of like an elf or something. I love the art. On the back it says something about there being a social experiment and you just have to like tell the brewer what you think of this and uh, it enters you in winning prizes. So this is obviously something kind of, kind of new, a newish beer. Hmm. This is good. Um, this is just my first day here in London. This was a trip from, uh, this is, oh boy, I'm already sort of stuttering. Wow. Just two beers will do that, huh? Um, my fiance gave me this as a uh, Christmas present. I've always wanted to come here to London and uh, and now we're here. We're, we're buying comics and going to go to the Doctor Who experience and going to see uh, Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen in a play. It's uh, It's pretty exciting stuff. There's just soccer on like every channel. Um, you need one of these to get through. It's just this guy kicks it to that guy and that guy kicks it to this guy. No one scores. It's very exciting stuff. Olympics, not bad. At the risk of going full Chandler, could this beer be any more British? Old Speckled Hen. What a name. Here we go. All right, well, I don't know what I'm tasting. I'm gonna have to read the back of the label to, to understand this one. All right, I figured it out. It says that it's supposed to have a toffee character. So there's some sort of toffee element mixed into this. That makes sense, because there's a sweetness. Like, beer is generally bitter, but this has like a little bit of a sweetness, and I couldn't place it. It's toffee. Who? Thanks, old speckled hen. Hens, toffee, speckling, very British. I was gonna say I need a, a British snack, so I got myself some crisps. In I? Crisps, love. Tastes just like Lay's. It's getting harder and harder to hold up this camera. I'm gonna drink three, folks. Oh, look at this. My fiance got this for uh, her mom. It dances when it's in the sunlight. It's too dark now. See? Check out this bit of weirdness. Crabby's ginger beer, Scottish raspberry. I have no idea what to expect out of this thing. Here we go. Mmm. It does taste like raspberry. Oh, geez, it just tastes like a raspberry soda. Mmm. Chrissy, do you want to try some of this? Let's watch uh, some gymnastics, some Olympic gymna- some- Oh. Alright. I saved my favorite for last. Uh, I love this idea. I've never seen it in America. Maybe it does exist. I've just never seen it. A premixed gin and tonic. Just a can of gin and tonic. Yes, please. That's my drink of choice. If I could get this in a can, I'd be taking them all the time. I'd be taking it to work. I'd be taking it while I drive. I'd be taking it while I look over uh, kids or pets it for people. Let's see.
It's a decent gin and tonic. I didn't expect it to be like, you know, Bombay Sapphire or anything. Um, not in a can, but it's also not like just a, you know, bottom shelf level gin. It's a good mix. It, it, it's, yeah, this isn't bad at all. Oh, and I found another snack. This is great. Look at this, folks. Bacon flavored bashers. They're basically just chips. Hey. It tastes bacony. They're light and puffy. They're filled with air. All right. I love London. I love Judge Dredd. I'm going to finish this gin and tonic and go to bed. And tomorrow I'm going to go explore London. Keep reading comics.